Welcome to the Explorers, the Halloween edition. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. This year's big 1920s Halloween special needs a little bit more time in the cauldron. In the meantime, I'm releasing an exclusive spooky bonus episode from the dark days of 2020 out of my Patreon vault and sharing it with everyone. Let's take a visit to the apothecary, shall we? Grab your favorite vial of suspicious powder for later. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons who made this episode possible. My newest pirate queens, Allison and Piper. My newest lady president, Colette. My newest boss lady, Eden. My warrior queens, Kiana, Sarah. Two lovely Alexises, Amanda, Kate, Ika, June, Neve and Sloan, and Samantha. My Imperial Empresses, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, Bridget, Katie, Samara, and Teresa. And my Lady Pharaohs, Sophie, Laura, Kat, Kate, Cheryl, and the fabulous Courtney's. This show wouldn't be possible without the generous support of my patrons. For just a few dollars a month, they get each episode early and completely ad-free. Exclusive bonus episodes, discounts on merchandise, full interviews with guests, and more. To find out all about it, just go to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. A bell tinkles over a shop door in Rome. A young woman enters, nervously wringing her hands. The shelves are full of cosmetics, beautiful things meant to smooth complexions, create glittering illusions. But behind all that glitter lies something more sinister, and that's the thing this girl has come for. The woman behind the counter smiles, asking her what makeup she might be looking for. The girl holds out a shaking finger, pointing to the bottle with St. Nicholas on it. The woman nods, asking slowly if she understands how to use the ointment, if she knows what it is truly for. And the girl does, her friend whispered to her of it in a dark, quiet corner. This is the answer to all her desperate problems. It is the bomb that will send her husband into a forever sleep and let her be free at last. In October's bonus episode on the affair of the poisons, we met La Voisin, one of the sorceresses who helped a mistress poison French King Louis XIV. We started that story with the Marquis de Brinvilliers, who killed her father and two brothers by way of poison as well. The poison she used to do the deed was infamous, a liquid known by all as aqua tafana. It didn't come from France, but from Italy, where another pioneering poisoner flew under the radar for many decades. Her name is Julia Tofana. So join me as we delve into the life and strange times of another female poisoner, one who wielded her concoctions to free women of the ties that bound them and did it in some pretty innovative ways. In the course of her career, she will say under torture, Julia helps poison up to 600 women's husbands. Which begs the question, why are so many Renaissance women looking to off their spouse? The answer lies in a woman's situation in Italy during the period. The Renaissance, which takes place from roughly the 14th to the late 16th or early 17th century, is a time of immense cultural change. There's a rebirth of interest in learning in the classical world, and art and architecture both blossom. But it seems that women's freedoms and opportunities do not blossom with it. If you're a woman from the upper classes, as many of Julia's clients are, you have very little access to education and no public role in politics. As children, we Renaissance daughters are often forgotten, left in the shadows to learn to be modest, industrious, and obedient until we're old enough to prove of use. The Renaissance view of women is nicely expressed in Italy's sumptuary laws of the time, which dictate what people are allowed to wear in public. 
Between 1200 and 1500, there were some 135 laws regulating women's clothes and just 25 regulating men's. I mean, women can't be trusted to dress appropriately and in ways befitting their inner piety, and that could cause problems. Women are considered inferior to men, stained as they are by Eve's fall. As Florence's 1433 sumptuary law puts it, Women are unmindful that nature deems it inappropriate for them to adorn themselves with such sumptuous ornamentation, which cause manly vigor to fail. So if a man acts badly, as per usual, let's blame the ladies. Of course, many women defy these laws and wear what they feel like. They just make sure to pop into a church or down a side street when a member of the fashion police walks by. Our honor, in other words, our sexual purity, is one of our most guarded and powerful assets. If she loses it, even if she does so against her will, it makes her unmarriable. Take Artemisia Gentileschi. She really deserves her own episode, and I'm sure we'll get to her on the show one day. Born in Rome in 1593 to a prominent painter, she will go on to become one of the first and most successful female artists in the period to make her own living through her artistry, though it's clear she understood the frustrating limits placed on women of her time. I fear that before you saw the painting, you must have thought me arrogant and presumptuous, she wrote to her patron in 1649. You think me pitiful because a woman's name raises doubts until her work is seen. But before that, she becomes the subject of a horrible crime. In 1611, she is raped by a friend of her father's who's supposed to be instructing her in painting. When her dad gets home, he denounces the friend to the police and he is brought to trial. To make a horrible wrong against his daughter right, you assume? Not exactly. It's because the rapist, a guy named Tassie, promised after the assault that he'd marry Artemisia, and then he reneged. So basically, her honor is ruined. How's her father supposed to get her married now? Artemisia is forced to detail the whole thing in an all-male court, subjected to a pelvic exam, and tortured with thumbscrews to ensure her words are truthful. This is the ring you give me, she shouts at her rapist as they turn the screws on her painter's hands. And these are your promises. If this makes you feel rageful, please go and look at the painting I've put in the show notes, in which Artemisia renders in lovely detail a woman sawing a man's head off. You're welcome. Tassie is exiled, but later finds a way to return to Rome, and Artemisia marries someone else and moves to Florence. Because she loves the guy? Maybe. Or perhaps because it feels like she has little other choice. <laughs> We Renaissance women have only two options when we enter adulthood. We can marry or become a nun. No matter which way you go, you'll need a dowry, since you'll have no way to make money on your own. At least if you're an upper-class woman, they aren't allowed to work. Even breastfeeding is seen as a lower-class woman's job. Women are kept at home and tightly watched by their fathers. And when you marry, you become your husband's property. So your ability to eat and keep a roof over your head will, forever and always, be tied to a man. Women are often used as pawns by their fathers, sold into marriages not of their choosing, and very often to an older man. Good to see those good old ancient Roman family values. And in a time and place where women are considered spiritually and intellectually inferior, held to a very tight band of expected duties and behaviors, abuse seems a fairly common household happening. But there is a potential silver lining for those unhappy marriages, and that is widowhood. Women are often still young when their husbands die, and they have more control over their assets and command respect in the community. And so widowhood is a place that many women long to be. Enter Julia Tofana. She is part of a thriving underground network of alchemists, apothecaries, and magical practitioners who step in to help these women out. Renaissance Italy, it turns out, is an absolute hotbed of poison, practiced by aristocratic families who want to control the wheel of power. Murder becomes such a common occurrence that when someone important dies, pretty much everyone assumes someone slipped a little something into his dessert wine. The Borgia family become rather famous for offing people during dinner. 
The de' Medici family have poison factories where they test out their concoctions on prisoners and animals. Many include the so-called Three Kingdoms of Nature, animals, plants, and minerals, with ingredients like snake venom, aconite, belladonna, strychnine, arsenic, and lead. Rumor has it that the Borgias slip poison to people in all sorts of ways, in their drinks, on their clothes, sprinkled into book pages, and pressed into flowers. They store their concoctions in a basement with as much care, it's said, as their fanciest wines. They are always in search of the ideal poison, one that is reliable, effective, deceptive, and slow-acting enough to kill the victim without it looking like foul play. And it's here that the enterprising Julia Tofana really comes into her own. We don't know much about Julia's childhood. It's said she's born around 1620 in Palermo in Sicily to a woman named Thofania Diamato. It turns out that Julia may have learned a whole lot from Mama about the poisonous arts. In 1633, she was executed for the murder of her husband. Years later, Julia becomes a widow herself. By natural means or by poison, we have no way of knowing. And she and her daughter, Girolama, move to Naples, then to Rome. It's there that she allegedly starts selling a concoction meant to covertly off a husband, what will famously become known as Aqua Tofana. We don't know exactly what she puts in it, but rumor has it there's arsenic, lead, and belladonna. It's also sometimes called deadly nightshade and is related to tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplant. But unlike those things, only a small amount can really hurt you. Like many things in nature, belladonna can be used as either a poison or a remedy, depending on how you apply it. It's even been used as a beauty aid. When Carl Linnaeus classifies it years later, he will call the plant belladonna, which means beautiful woman in Italian, because legend has it Renaissance women would put its berry juice into their eyes to dilate their pupils for a seductive effect. Even a small amount can mess with your nervous system, causing tremors, blurred vision, headaches, a sensitivity to light, hallucinations, even convulsions and paralysis. Just two berries have the power to kill a child, but you don't need much more than that to hurt a fully grown human. Tacitus tells us that our old friend Livia poisons her husband Augustus's figs with belladonna. Whatever, Tacitus. So much about Julia's business remains shady, but what's very clear is that she is very clever about how she plies her trade. As a cosmetics dealer, she finds ways of hiding her lethal poison in feminine beauty products. She can sell her poisons right over the counter to the women who want them, and no one looking would ever know. She also sometimes bottles them up as a healing oil, slapping on a label that says Manna of St. Nicholas of Bari, which is a popular healing oil for blemishes at the time. But it's the opposite of healing. Tasteless, odorless, and undetectable, it's said that it can kill a man in only four drops. Delivered a few times over a series of days, dropped covertly into a wine glass, a man will develop symptoms not unlike a cold, suffering from weakness and exhaustion. Then it worsens with symptoms like stomach ache, extreme thirst, and dysentery. He'll be aware enough, however, of his decline to get his affairs in order, making sure his wife will be looked after. And then he dies, apparently of one of the many diseases that afflict people of the era, and that doctors don't really understand. And here's the amazing thing. Even in death, no one can tell he's been poisoned. To save her fair fame, someone will write of Aqua Tafana all the way in 1890. The wife would demand a post-mortem examination. Result? Nothing. Except that the woman was able to pose as a slandered innocent. And then it would be remembered that her husband died without either pain, inflammation, fever, or spasms. If, after this, the woman within a year or two formed a new connection, nobody could blame her. Working with her daughter Girolama and a tight-knit team of women, she becomes known on the quiet as a friend to abused and troubled women. And she must be quite clever and discreet in her dealings, because she goes on helping them take care of their husband problems for decades. Until one day in 1650, when a customer tries to pour some poison into her husband's soup and gets caught. 
Apparently, she changes her mind at the last minute and tearfully begs him not to eat it. He then beats her soundly until she confesses the rest. The wife gets turned in and is tortured by authorities, which leads to another confession. She bought the poison from Julia Tofana. But Julia has friends who tip her off to what's happening. She escapes to a church and is given sanctuary. But then the authorities start spreading a rumor that she's used Aqua Tofana to poison the city's water supply, and the church isn't having that. They turn her over to the police. She then endures a whole lot of torture, under which she confesses to killing as many as 600 men with her ingenious methods. She might just have been the most successful serial killer of her era or any other. I'm not going to hand her out a gold medal for being a stellar human or anything, but we have to give her credit for using her potion for at least some form of good. What happens next is hazy. Legend has it that in 1659, Julia, her daughter, and three of her helpers are all put to death in Rome. Her body is thrown over the wall of the church that once sheltered her. Some 40 of her lower-class customers are put to death as well, some of them bricked up in the dungeons of the Palace of the Holy Office, much like the Vestal Virgins were once buried in a room below ground if condemned. Her upper-class clients are either imprisoned or let off entirely. Are you overly shocked by this? I'm not. But some accounts say Julia goes on living and poisoning for many decades longer. And even after her death, it seems her potion has the power to be killing men. Like in 1791, when composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart falls ill at the age of 35. I am sure that I have been poisoned, he supposedly said. I cannot rid myself of this idea. Someone has given me aqua tafana and calculated the precise time of my death. We don't think it was actually foul play or poison, but that he knew of Julia's product by name speaks to its fame. Even in death, Julia Tofana was still striking fear into the hearts of men. Thanks for listening. If you liked it, leave me a comment below. And if you have any suggestions for a future She Did What or What She Wore minisodes, I'd be more than happy to hear them. I'll be back with more soon. Thanks for listening. If you like The Explorers, tell a friend, leave a review wherever you listen, become a patron of the show, or shoot me a message telling me what you love about it. You can also go to my website and buy some pretty sweet Explorers merch. Much love to Carly Quinn for all her help with The Explorers. You can find show notes for this episode at my website, theexplorerspodcast.com. You can also find me on Instagram at The Podcast. <laughs>